Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I have mentioned in previous segments that I'm well aware that I have church on the brain as we're counting down the days until the opening of the first worship service for Sovereign Grace Fellowship. Well, along the lines of that uh, zeal and passion that I have, uh, I've been blessed to have my wife uh, continue to drop wisdom on me with respect to this and to prepare me for, uh, well, the hard work, the slow work of planting a church when she says to me, dear, let's not despise the day of small beginnings. Now, I mention that because we are in part four of our ongoing series titled Parables, and we come now to that smallest of parables, the parable of the mustard seed. You recall in the parable of the mustard seed, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to the mustard seed and notes that it is the smallest of all the seeds, and yet over time it grows and becomes a great plant and uh, does great things. Now, before I get to the meaning of this parable, I think it's important that we do a little apologetic work. That is, Jesus says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, and there were people who will jump and down, up and down and say, See, Jesus is wrong here. We know that there are smaller seeds than mustard seeds. And worse than that, not only do we know that there are smaller seeds than mustard seeds, but in Jesus' day, where Jesus lived, people knew that the mustard seed was not the smallest seed, which is ironically uh, where we're going to plant our apologetic flag. That is, uh, Jesus is not actually intending here to describe uh, or to give a lesson in the size of seeds. Rather, he is seizing upon a common expression. The mustard seed was used as an idiom in that culture, in that day, for something very, very small. And so when he says it's the smallest of seeds, that's all he's doing is tapping into that uh, idiom. He's not saying it. there's nothing smaller. What is he saying? Well, what he's saying is that the kingdom of God, the inauguration of the kingdom of God, and the consummation of the kingdom of God are radically different things. They share in common the reality of the reign of the king, the reality of the defeat of the serpent, uh, but... One is that day of small beginnings, the inauguration. The other is the celebration of the end of all things, the consummation. So what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God is like that. It starts out small. It starts out slow. Think about how many people were aware of the incarnation when it happened. You could probably count them on your fingers and your toes. No one knew. If the shepherds knew, the wise men knew, Mary and Joseph knew, Elizabeth and Zechariah knew, outside of that, pretty much nobody knew. And nothing happened for the first 30 years. And then Jesus begins his public ministry, and it does grow relatively rapidly, but even at its peak, it's centered still in this out-of-the-way place that we call Palestine. 
And slowly it began to spread from there. And it spread from where it spread and spread and it spread. It took 1,600 years for the kingdom of God to even touch upon the new world. Having this perspective ought to impact. In fact, I think that's what Jesus is trying to do here. It ought to impact whether we look at things pessimistically or optimistically. Glass half full, glass half empty. It is so easy for us to look at our cultural decline over the last 60, 70 years, to look at the cultural decline of the West over the last 150 years and think, oh, things are getting so much worse. But when you look at the big picture and you start at the birth of Jesus and to where we are now, you see that mustard seed spreading and growing, its roots going deeper, the birds finding a place of security and safety there. The gospel, the message that the kingdom of God is at hand That the kingdom of God is here. That the king is seated at the right hand of the father. Makes impact. This is the rock uncut by human hands which destroys every earthly power and which rock grows until it covers the whole of the earth. Friends, let us not despise the day of small beginnings. Let's not despise the day of medium be- medium middles. Let's not despise the day of not quite finished, almost to the ends. Let's trust God to do what he's doing in his time frame for his glory and know that not only will he win, but that he has already won. Be of good cheer, for he has already overcome the world. There's a reason why I have been doing just about every week a segment that we call the Bible in five minutes. I'm concerned, I'm afraid that one of the weaknesses that we have with respect to understanding the Bible is we just don't know what's in it. It's a big book, a huge book. And it's just helpful to know things as simple and basic as Noah came before Moses. David came before Solomon. Those kinds of simple, basic things put things in context for us when we hear the word preach. Now, I mention this not as an advertisement for my particular segment, but for today's Curating Your Book Library segment. I'm going to speak to you about a book that I had the privilege of working on, uh, but the authors are my father, R.C. Sproul, and my dear friend and my literary agent, Robert Walgamuth. The name of the book is What's in the Bible? The subtitle, A Tour of Scripture from the Dust of Creation to the Glory of Revelation. Now that subtitle may ring a bell for some of you because you may understand that Ligonier Ministries uh, developed a teaching series that was an overview of the whole Bible uh, that was called Dust to Glory. Well, that's what this book is based upon. And part of the work that I did on this book uh, was working, moving from transcript of uh, audio to a transcript for a book. I was a part of that process, not alone, but a part of that process. And what we end up with here is a book that is still pretty big, still pretty long. It's about 400 pages. Uh, It's published, by the way, by Thomas Nelson. Um, And it's, well, it's an out, or it's an exposition of the whole of the Bible. Every one of uh, 
the books of the Bible is given its own separate treatment. And so you can get here a, a overarching guide of God's word and you get it from R.C. Sproul. Now, if we know anything about my father, we know that one of his most powerful gifts was his ability to take complex truths and help those who are not familiar with them to understand them. He had an ability to uh, simplify without making things simplistic, without distorting. And so this project is just right in line with that particular strength, not necessarily because the Bible is so com complicated, but it is complex. It was written over the space of uh, 1,500 years, and something like 40 different writers, at least three different languages. Uh, that's a lot uh, of complexity. And yet... Our calling is to know this, to, to have this hidden in our hearts. Well, this book isn't a book on how to memorize scripture, a book on which verses ought to be memorized, but it gives you a framework. It gives you an outline. It gives you a kind of uh, a map to the whole of the Bible. And that's why I commend it. You may remember when, no, did we? No, we didn't talk about that on the podcast. We're going to talk about uh, in the future, uh, Nate Pickowitz's book, How to Eat Your Bible. Uh, and it has a similar value in that it encourages us to open up our Bibles and to read them. And it addresses the problem that I'm describing by uh, that old adage that the way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. The Bible is big. The Bible is scary. The Bible is complex. But the Bible is also perspicuous. This was one of the key doctrines that led to the Reformation, the perspicuity of Scripture. I like to say this about perspicuity. It's one of those words that isn't the way it sounds. <laughs> perspicuous only means clear. Uh, but it's the less clear word than clear. <laughs> you wonder why we use it. Uh, but the Bible is perspicuous. That is, it doesn't take an expert to understand it. That doesn't mean that God hasn't blessed us with teachers and with scholars and, and that scholarship is unimportant. Of course, it's important. And those tools are important. But it's also important that we remember that the Bible is understandable. But we need to know what's in it. We need to know what it says. Now, I have said over the years that the Bible can be reduced down to this biblical outline. Roman numeral 1, Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Roman numeral 2, Genesis 3, fall. Roman numeral 3, Genesis 4, through Revelation 22 trying to get back to Genesis 1 and 2, only better. Now, that doesn't take a whole book. That you can get in a, in a minute or two of a podcast. But this book, What's in the Bible, will give you more detail, more richness, more truth. I commend it to you. It's uh, It was, a, a, again, a project that I'm proud uh, to have been a part of. I would love to hear your thoughts what did you, if you've read the book or if you've listened to the series, Dust to Glory, what's in the Bible? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, that includes you, Steve. Thank you again for your faithfulness. And uh, God bless you all. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.